throughout our lives we are shaped by our experiences. They not only change our behaviour, but even how we think. How this happens is not completely understood, but one important mechanism may be corresponding physical changes in the connections between neurons in our brain. The changing and shaping of connections in our brain is known as synaptic plasticity. One of the first people to think about the plastic nature of the brain was Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb. In his book, The Organization of Brain and Behavior, he wrote his now classic Hebb's postulate. Simply put, when two neurons fire at the same time, the connections between them are strengthened, and thus they become more likely to fire again in the future. And when two neurons repeatedly fire in an uncoordinated manner, the connections between them weaken, and they are more likely to act independently in the future. This can be simplified to the mantra, cells that fire together wire together, and cells that fire apart wire apart. But what do we mean by the strength of a connection? When an action potential reaches the end of a presynaptic cell, it causes the release of neurotransmitters. These cross the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell. These receptors can be metabolic receptors or ion channels. When a neurotransmitter stimulates a metabolic receptor, it triggers a cascade of secondary messengers which may alter a number of proteins within the cell. And when a neurotransmitter stimulates an ion channel, it may cause it to open or close altering the flow of ions through it and causing a change in voltage in the postsynaptic cell. These changes can be excitatory or inhibitory. Usually, a single incoming stimulus at the synapse induces a sub-threshold potential, and when many, possibly hundreds, combine, they cause a depolarization. The degree of voltage change in the postsynaptic neuron is what we mean by the strength of a connection. Strengthening of a synapse is known as long-term potentiation. The change in potential evoked by the presynaptic neuron will be greater. And the weakening of synaptic strength is known as long-term depression. The change in potential will be smaller. But what determines whether a synapse will undergo LTP or LTD? It's all a matter of timing. There is a critical window for synaptic plasticity, with the peak time for changes to synaptic strength being in 20 milliseconds before and after an action potential. If the presynaptic neuron fires before the postsynaptic neuron, within the preceding 20 milliseconds, long-term potentiation occurs. And if the presynaptic neuron fires after the postsynaptic neuron, within the following 20 milliseconds, long-term depression occurs. This is known as spike timing dependent plasticity, and we can alter the initial Hebbian hypothesis to include these new findings. If the presynaptic neuron fires within a window of 20 milliseconds before the postsynaptic neuron, the synapse will be strengthened. However, if the presynaptic neuron fires within a window of 20 milliseconds after the postsynaptic neuron, the synapse will be weakened. But how does this happen? Well, the best understood example is synaptic plasticity in hippocampal neurons, and in this case, it's all to do with glutamate receptors. Glutamate is the principal excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and there are two particularly important glutamate receptors, AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. The AMPA receptor is permeable to potassium and sodium, and it is this inward flux through the AMPA receptor which depolarizes the cell. The NMDA receptors, in contrast, are blocked by magnesium at negative voltages, and therefore do not significantly contribute to postsynaptic depolarization of the cell. However, once the cell is depolarized, the magnesium is displaced, and ions then flow through the NMDA receptor. Importantly, the NMDA receptor also allows calcium to flow through. It is the nature of this calcium current which causes spike timing dependent plasticity. If the presynaptic neuron fires first, it becomes depolarized and releases glutamate. The glutamate binds to AMPA receptors at the postsynaptic neuron, causing it to depolarize. As the cell becomes depolarized, NMDA receptors become unblocked. Glutamate binds to them, and this causes a large calcium influx. If the postsynaptic neuron fires first, it becomes depolarized. As it is repolarizing, the presynaptic neuron fires and releases glutamate. When the glutamate reaches the postsynaptic cell, it finds it repolarizing and at a lower voltage. This means there are fewer NMDA receptors available to bind to. This leads to a more moderate calcium influx. A large calcium influx leads to long-term potentiation, or LTP, and a small calcium influx leads to long-term depression known as LTD. But how does this happen? In the cell, AMPA receptors are constantly being recycled. New ones are undergoing exocytosis onto the perisynaptic sites 
where they then migrate to postsynaptic areas. And receptors at the postsynaptic areas are migrating to the perisynaptic sites, where they undergo endocytosis and are brought back into the cell. Endosomes inside the neuron are thought to contain a pool of AMPA receptors. A calcium influx large enough to cross a critical threshold will activate calcium-dependent kinases. These kinases alter the recycling of AMPA receptors. In particular, they increase the exocytosis of them. They also phosphorylate AMPA receptors, changing their structure to make them more permeable. This means that when glutamate crosses the synapse, more AMPA receptors are there to open, more current flows through, and the change in potential is increased. A more moderate calcium influx does not cross the critical threshold necessary to activate calcium-dependent kinases, and instead, it only activates protein phosphatases. These again alter the recycling of AMPA receptors, but in the opposite way. They increase the endocytosis of AMPA receptors, decreasing the number of them available at the postsynaptic terminal. This means that when glutamate again crosses the synapse, fewer receptors are there to open, less current flows through, and the change in potential is decreased. So, in conclusion, if the postsynaptic neuron fires within the 20 milliseconds after the presynaptic neuron, glutamate combines to lots of NMDA receptors, and the calcium influx is large, triggering calcium-dependent kinases, which lead to more AMPA receptors at the dendrite. And if the postsynaptic neuron fires within 20 milliseconds before the presynaptic neuron, when the glutamate arrives, most of the NMDA receptors are blocked, so the calcium influx is small, and calcium-dependent phosphatases get triggered instead, leading to fewer AMPA receptors at that dendrite. Importantly, these processes are localised to individual dendrites, and each dendrite can be modulated individually. This process of weakening and strengthening connections changes the connectivity of the brain, altering the way you'll think and behave in future, and allowing you to learn and change.